So welcome. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz, and I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center. Uh, it's always exciting when we start a new book. Um, so today, uh, the virtual reading group will be starting uh, uh, Hannah Arendt's book, or Jerry Cohn's book, uh, Essays and Understanding. It's, uh, it's one of the first collections of Arendt's essays that um, uh, was published posthumously by, by Jerry Cohn, her literary executor and former, uh, former graduate student and graduate student assistant and researcher. Um, uh, we read a couple of years ago, volume two of, of these essays, Thinking Without a Bannister. Um, some of you, I think, joined us for those essays. Uh, but uh, we've surprisingly never read volume one, which um, has some extraordinary uh, texts in it, including uh, the first one, uh, which is uh, uh, an edited uh, transcript of um, Arendt's interview uh, with Gunter Gauss. Um, uh, it was from 1964. Uh, in October, it was actually aired. Uh, I think it was uh, a few months earlier that it was was filmed. Um, it's uh, it was part of a, a, a series, uh, a very popular uh, series on German TV, run by Gunter Gauss, called Zur Person or or to the Person. Um, and um, uh, Arendt, this is the 17th episode of the the series, um, and. Arendt is the first woman uh, who appears in the series, um, and and that comes up uh, immediately, as as we'll see in in a second. Um, I'm hearing an echo, uh, so I'm gonna. But uh, in any case, um, the first essay uh, is titled uh, by Jerry Cohn. What Remains, The Language Remains, A Conversation with Gunter Gauss. Um, I, it, the title is, is taken from a part of uh, the, the, the conversation in which um, uh, he asks her, you know, what do you miss of, of free Hitler, uh, Hitlerite Germany, and what remains? And she says, the language remains. Um, uh, it's a... The, 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 the great distinction of, of this interview um, is that you can actually watch it. And we sent around the links. I hope many of you got a chance to do so. Um, you know, there aren't that many recordings of Hannah Arendt. Um, there are, uh, and, and what we have is mostly in German, as is this. There's very few English uh, recordings. People always ask me, can I hear her in English? Uh, there's one or two. Um, there's a speech at Bard on 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 um, on violence, but not many. Uh, but in this talk, uh, you have an extraordinary conversation going on. You have a um, uh, a German Jewish American woman, Hannah Arendt, um, uh, just under 60 years old, um, chain smoking sitting there in conversation with a German man, her junior. Um, Arendt, I think, uh, performs um, in, this, in this conversation. You can't think of it any other way. And she, she, she performs as a, as a Jewish woman. Um, uh, th this is a, a moment of... of um, uh, a lot of feminist activity in the world. Uh, I think um, Betty Friedan's The Feminist Mystique has just been published in the United States. Um, and, and, and Arendt is also very much aware of the fact that she's talking to a German, a German man in Germany in German. Um, and she, she, makes, she makes note of that a number of times. Um, and I think we... And one of the beauties of watching her is to see her playfulness, uh, um, her charm, uh, her irony, uh, and the way she uh, at times deflects and, 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 and covers over things that may be uh, difficult or not. Um, 
and uh, that are not apparent and hard to make apparent in a transcript or translation. So, um, uh, you know, it's an extraordinary text and an extraordinary interview. And, and so um, for those of you who watched it, feel free to bring up the, 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 the question of, of, her, of her demeanor and, and her actions and, and things like that when we get into questions. Um, it's a wide ranging interview. Uh, it, it, it's, you know, and, 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 and I think I'm gonna try and keep the introduction a little short and, and let you guys talk about it. But it does begin um, with him asking about these two things. First, that she's a woman. Um, he says, uh, he doesn't mention that she's the first woman he's ever had on his show. But he does say she's the first woman in a, in a long-standing uh, male field of philosophy. And this leads to two um, conversations. One about, is she a philosopher? Uh, and the second is, is she in any way a feminist? Um, and the first one, she answers very clearly, no. Uh, she says, I'm not a philosopher. Uh, I, I studied philosophy. Uh, um, she say, she'll say later that I, I loved philosophy and I knew from the age of 14 that I wanted to be, uh, to study philosophy. Uh, in other texts, mainly in letters, she will tell people that her true home in many ways, what she most identifies with as sort of like where she comes from is German philosophy. But she's not a philosopher, she says. She's a political, she uses the term political theorist. Um, uh, for her, uh, the reason she doesn't identify as a philosopher is that what philosophy seeks in some sense for her is truth, a kind of objective truth. Philosophy, therefore, um, has contempt for opinion uh, in Greek doxa. It has contempt for uh, those who would um, uh, state their opinion and not prove it. And, and, and Arendt has chosen the life of someone who thinks about politics. And for her, politics means opinion, not truth. There are no truths in politics, one of the sort of core Arendtian thoughts. And, and, and so philosophers, insofar as they, the quintessential philosopher is the, is the philosopher who sits alone and thinks and tries to contemplate some truth, um, it, is, it is really antithetical uh, to what she thought, thinks of as the, the public world, the world of philosopher, um, of politics. And so she announces that she's a political theorist. You know, I, I, I think she, what she means is she's a political thinker. Um, she's not a fan of theory. Uh, and that's something we, we can get back into. Um, she says, of course, there could be a woman philosopher, um, but, uh, you know, I'm not it. Um, and then the question of feminism arises and she's like, she says some things that are going to make people wonder, you know, uh, there are, I've always, she says, I've always thought there are certain occupations improper for a woman. It doesn't look good when a woman gives orders, right? She, you know, I mean, we, we have to remember RN, you know, born in 1906. She has a strong sense of, of what might be called feminine propriety. Um, but she says also that for me, this never played a role. To put it very simply, I have always done what I liked to do. Um, you know, uh, Arendt's role and, 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 and place in the world of, of, of feminism or women thinkers or women, uh, uh, famous women is, is, is complicated. She, she clearly had issues with a kind of um, feminist movement as with all movements. But uh, um, we can talk more about her as a, a, a feminist icon, which she's, by the way, I think become for many people. Um, and we have uh, an essay coming out in the next uh, volume of the RN Center Journal uh, by Jana Schmidt, the former fellow at the RN Center, uh, arguing that Arendt is a, a, an important feminist thinker. Um, uh, you know, uh, what else is, what are the main um, topics of the interview? Uh, she's asked whether she wants to achieve influence with her work. And she says, basically, no, that's a masculine question. Men want to achieve influence on others. I want to understand. And so here's a typical Arendtian um, 
response. She says, I write because I wouldn't remember what I think if I didn't write. If I had a great memory, maybe I wouldn't write. Um, she basically writes to work out problems, she says. Um, all of her writing, she says, also is an abschreiber, a, a writing down after the thought. I mean, this is one of the things that I think is, is amazing about Arendt is, and, and, and for those of you who write, it's, it's something, you know, people have different styles, but she worked out notes and she worked out ideas, but when she sat down to write, as she said, she's usually thought it through and she knows what she wants to say. Um, I think there's also a, a, a lot of interesting history in, in, this, in this interview. Um, she says, really, she only got interested in politics or came to politics in 1931. Um, and that it was in 1933 that uh, uh, when the Reichstag burned. And interestingly enough, she doesn't just mention the burning of the Reichstag. She mentions the illegal arrests of the same night. Um, she says, this was an unmediated shock. Um, and she immediately saw that Jews could not remain in Germany if they weren't going to be second-class citizens, which she did not want to be. She's asked a lot about uh, her childhood as a Jew. Uh, I think this is a, a German man asking uh, a Jewish woman uh, um, about what it was like. I think there's a lot of interest in this. And for her, she says, to be a Jew belongs for me to the indubitable, indubitable facts of my life. And I never wanted to change anything about such facts, not even in my childhood. Um, I think there's a lot here to, to unpack. Uh, you know, there's a, I mean, there's an attitude to RN. She says, all Jewish children encountered anti-Semitism. It poisoned the souls of many children. The difference with us was that my mother was always convinced that you mustn't let it get to you. You have to defend yourself. And she very specifically says to, to Gauss, I'm not speaking for Jews. Look, you know, I'm just telling you my personal experience. She's very aware that many other Jews had different experiences of their childhoods. And she's obviously aware that 6 million Jews were killed. She's, she's speaking for herself. She goes to France and she works for the youth Aliyah, youth Aliyah uh, and she gives credit to... Uh, um, uh, Recha Fryer and, and Henrietta Scholl, who, Scholl, who founded it. Um, the, the most interesting part of this, I think, is that she really emphasizes to Gauss, you know, here it is, Gauss, who is Gauss? He's a German intellectual who interviews intellectuals on TV. And what she emphasizes is, I went to France and I went to work in the Youth Aliyah, where I cooked and cleaned and helped kids with their homework and help them get papers because I wanted to avoid all intellectual work and all intellectuals. Now, I mean, let's also remember, she was at the time close friends with Walter Benjamin. Um, she was hanging out in an intellectual milieu. So you have to take some of this in, 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 and interpret it as you want. But what she's saying is that she was rebelling against intellectuals. Why, she says? Um, uh, because uh, in Germany, while we all knew that Nazis were our enemies, um, it was the intellectuals, she said, more so than her other friends who coordinated with the Nazis. The, the word in German is Gleichschaltung. Uh, it's, it's sort of a word that's become widely used for those Germans and others who coordinated with the Nazis. Um, and what she says is many of her friends um, and many other intellectuals, almost all of them, um, coordinated with the Nazis. Um, and they made up the most fantastic and interesting things about Hitler that she found grotesque, she says. Um, she says, among many people, Gleichschaltung happened, but not was not the rule. But it was among intellectuals that it's the rule. And this is a theme... Um, this theme of why intellectuals, this theme of why intellectuals more so than other people coordinate with evil regimes is one that Arendt comes back to throughout her work. Um, uh, in a way, uh, what she comes to believe is that intellectuals are those who are taught and proud of their capacity to rationalize things. 
They're, they're proud of their capacity to, in reasoning, um, uh, rationalize, to, to make sense of things that shouldn't be made sense of. And so when she arrives in Paris in, in 1933, she wants to get as far away from intellectuals as she can. And so she um, joins, she becomes a member of the Youth Aliyah and basically works as a social worker. And I think this is an important part of, of RN's history that, that it's important, that we, that we need to take seriously. Um, this is also where she talks about her, her, her belief that, um, you know, what, when you're attacked as a Jew, you must defend yourself as a Jew, not as a German, not as a citizen, not as an upholder of the rights of man, but you have to be deeply concrete. And she says also the only ones who were defending the Jews were the Zionists. Even though I had never been a Zionist before, I joined the Zionist um, because my problem was a political problem. Uh, I was a Jew and that became a political issue. And the Zionists, she says, were the only ones who were willing to address it as a political problem. Um, she's then asked about what she misses, maybe about pre-Hitlerite Germany. And she says, I have no sense, I have no longing for that time. But what remains, she says, is sprache, is the language. Um, and she'll talk about that uh, in the next few pages. You know, what Arendt really loves about the language, yeah, she talks about the sound. She says, you know, when I come back, when I came back to Germany and heard the sound, it was a joy. You know, it was her Muttersprache, her mother language, her mother tongue. Um, and, but more so, what she loves about it is that in German, she has a whole rich vocabulary from poetry. Uh, you know, it's something she says a lot, that she knew a huge part of Jew German poetry by heart. And, um, and this matters, and it matters in her writing. I mean, for those of you who read her in English, you'll see she quotes poetry a lot. But if you read the same books in German, most of the books that she wrote in English first, she translated into German. Um, and they're quite different. And the biggest difference is that she adds in poetry, um, a lot of German poetry um, into the German text that's not in the English or is maybe just referred to in the English. And so the books become a bit different. And, um, and, and it's an important distinction. I mean, you can still read her in English. I think that, you know, I'm not saying that at all, but, but there's more of her and her poetry in her when she writes in, in German. Um, you see that in the, in the quotation of the poem uh, on page, uh, I think it's 19, um, uh, from, uh, uh, from Schiller. Uh, when she's talking about uh, the question of whether to be silent or not. Um, and she quotes uh, Schiller, when des Liedes stimmen schweigen von dem unbewundenen Mann, so will ich für Hectorn zeugen. You know, when I, uh, if the voices of song are silent, for whom has been vanquished, for he who has been vanquished, uh, I will testify for him. And this is for her an illustration of, I think, one of the main points Arendt wants to make in her writing about politics, and it's honestly one that not enough people have paid attention to, which is the difference uh, between objectivity and impartiality. Um, I said before that Arendt says she gave up being a philosopher, and it was largely because of this idea of objectivity. She, she finds objectivity um, to be outside of and not not consonant with what it means to be a political person. Politics is about opinion. Opinions are not objective, they're personal. They're, they're subjective in a big way. Um, but impartiality is, she thinks, a deeply important uh, um, uh, attitude, both for the historian and for the political thinker. Someone who's impartial is willing to speak for and seek to understand other people from other perspectives. And it's that impartiality, which is different from objectivity, that um, Arendt embraces. And so when, when Gauss asks her that uh, in case of doubt, you would prefer the truth, she says, 
No, I would rather say impartiality, um, which she says came into the world with Homer and she cites the Schiller poem. And so in, in turning to the poem and seeing, and you see this a lot in her writing, even in English, you see how knowing the poetry drives her thinking in so many ways. And so here, when she's trying to, she's asked this question about the Eichmann book, when should you have, should you have remained silent, right? Should you have maybe not spoken and not caused such discomfort for Jews um, about the Jewish like Shatul um, by some of the kapos in the camp or some of the, the Jewish leaders? You know, she says, look, it was 20 years ago. It's a long time. He says, well, for some people, not so long. And she's like, look, it's a good, good question. It's the only really good question that people have asked me about this book, she says. And, um, and, and she says, you know, maybe I could have remained silent. Um, but, uh, you know, I believe, and she turns to home. I believe in impartiality. I believe not in saying the truth, but in letting the perspectival, let the variety of opinions of the world enter. Um, and that's what Homer did. That's what Herodotus did. And, and it's what she says um, she wants to do as well. Um, they talk a bit about the controversy, the Eichmann book. We can get into that if you're interested in it. Uh, the, 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 the line that she, uh, the, 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 the famous line that she writes to Gershom Sholem, where she says, I have never loved uh, any people, a collectivity, the Germans, the French, the Americans, the working class, or even the Jews comes up and, and she says some interesting things about it that she says to be belong to, to be a part of a group, whether it's to be a Jew or to be white or black or American or German, that's natural. That's given. Uh, we're, we're born that way uh, into a world in which that happens, but to organize into a group, black lives matter, Jewish Defense Fund, you know, whatever it is, um, that thing, that's, that's different because then we, are, we, 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 we organize ourselves around common interests. And she reminds us of what an interest is, an interesse in Latin, to be, essay, between, inter. And that we create a world of interests between us. And that um, that world of interests is common to people and it's different from love. It's different from the closeness that one feels with one's family or one's lovers or one's friends or one's co-religionists, if you will. Um, and she says, you can't confuse these two. Um, great. The last thing I guess I want to mention um, is near the end of the essay when, when Gauss comes to the question of the human condition, uh, the book she publishes in 1958. Um, so the last book before the Eichmann book. Um, and and, and she, he asks her about this question of the world, which is, a, you know, for those of you who've been in this group for a little while, know that the common world, the shared world, the world where we have interest together is, is one of the absolutely central ideas of Arendt's uh, thinking. And um, she says now in this essay, uh, in 1964, in this, in this interview, I comprehend the world in a much larger sense now. She's sort of adding to her interpretation of what the world is. And she says some very revealing things as the space in which things become public. So the world is that space in which things become public, become seen, become a visible. In the space in which one lives and which one must look presentable, right? It's, it's where we appear. Um, and how we look, do we want on a jacket? Do we, what kind of shirt do we wear? You know, we all have to think about this now as we're uh, on Zoom. Um, and she actually then mentions John F. Kennedy and she says, Kennedy tried to expand the public space quite decisively by inviting poets and ne'er-do-wells into the White House and saying poetry too is part of our public world, which Arendt took very seriously. Um, and yet, then the conversation turns to the question of, are we losing our public world? Like this is one of the themes of much of her work. And she says that, and Gauss asks, as labor and consumption become more and more important, um, insofar as 
And, and what does that mean? It means that insofar as we identify ourselves as laborers. So if someone asks you, you know, you go to a party and you say, who are you or what do you do? Well, it's very indicative. We say, what do you do? Your labor, what you do, largely begins to define you. And Arendt is very clear in her work and her thinking that that's not accidental. That for most of us in the modern world, um, what we do becomes who we are. And that increasingly we identify not only with what we do, but we say, I only do what I do because I need to make money. I mean, this is the kind of, you know, some people call false humility, but you know, you're, you're the president of the United States and people say, oh, that's great. Goes, well, it's a living, I make a living, right? Um, the point is, uh, you know, people don't want to assume a kind of arrogance that if I'm an artist or a professor or a, an engineer or whatever, that I do it because I love it or I do it because it's, you know, it's, it's meaningful. We all sort of say, well, I need to make a living. It's kind of middle class uh, 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 humility. And yet in doing so, she says, we show that what we really value is doing things in order to make money and thus to live and to consume. And um, out of this, insofar as consumption becomes the dominant way in which we engage the world, we keep buying new things. Our computers die, we buy a new one. Our pen goes bad, we buy a new one. Um, in the end, in public, when we appear, we appear as people whose main interests are what we consume. Uh, more than that, um, we demand happiness. I mean, and this is the real, uh, the real thrust of what she's arguing. We need a kind of universal happiness. And in order to get that happiness, we need to labor in order to consume. And, um, uh, and, and that is, 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 is what she is after. And we wear down the durability of the world, of this common public world. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that, except to say that, you know, so he, especially if you watch the interview, you, you see Arendt entering the public world. You see her performing, appearing, um, and appearing um, uh, in a way that is uh, uh, deeply Jewish, and I would say feminine, uh, which, um, uh, you know, is something she, she takes on the mantle of an American, of a woman and as a Jew on this show in a way that is, is somewhat um, different than, than, than might have been expected if you just know her work. And so these are things we can continue to talk about. Uh, so um, uh, I see there's a bunch of people on today, which is great. I'm thrilled. This is a fantastic book, uh, Essays and Understanding. Uh, and I really do hope uh, you all uh, uh, are able to join us uh, for most of it uh, as we go forward. But let me open the conversation to conversations. There's different ways you can talk. Uh, you can raise your hand in the uh, raised hand function. If you go to the, if you go to the uh, uh, participants part, um, and you can also write in the chat. It looks like Samantha is unable to join us today, so I'm going to have to try and and uh, balance reading the chat and and talking to you all. So. Um, uh, we'll do our best. I see Susan Oberman has a question. So Susan, why don't you start it off? Hey, am I unmuted? Susan, you have to, are you unmuted? Uh, uh, try again. Unmuted, yes. Am I, okay. okay, can you yes, hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so there were a couple of things. One is I think that the uh, interviewer does acknowledge that she's the first woman that he interviewed in that series. I'm pretty oh. sure he does. Um, the other thing I noticed because I, I read the transcript and watched the video is that there's a section where he asks her when they're talking about the tone in Eichmann and her being criticized, there's a section where there's uh, piece left out, and I don't know why they do that, but it's where he asks her if she's angry, and she says no, there's no point, 
but her body language at that moment is very telling. She takes her glasses off, she rubs her eyes very vigorously. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of body language. In, it was fascinating watching it. Um, not an expert on that, but um, to me, I noticed various points where her body language kind of told the truth. The other question I wanted to raise, and maybe you can talk about. She talks about having disdain for other people that came out of experiences when she was young and she didn't realize that she was different. And so I wonder if you could enlighten us about that at all. I found that interesting, but I don't really know what it was exactly she was saying there. Um, okay. Uh, really good questions and thoughts. Um, uh, I mean, as, as for the interview and the body language, yes, that's why I really did encourage as many people as possible to watch the interview. I, um, I think this is one of the great interviews I've ever seen. Um, uh, and uh, I should say um, a friend of mine, Natan Schneider, an Israeli uh, um, thinker, a great Israeli thinker, um, has written a wonderful essay um, about this interview, which will be published also in the next edition of the Hannah Arendt Center Journal. Um, so I'm really excited for that. But he goes into a lot of that history and, and body language and, and the history behind it. Um, the disdain question that you raise, um, I believe is when she's being asked about her childhood. Um, and I have to find the pages where she talks about it. Um, I don't know if anyone, uh, if you, if Susan, if you can find it, but uh, she, I, she, you know, she said, look, I was a little, he keeps, he keeps asking her, you know, did you realize you were different? Did you realize you were different? And, you know, she tries to say, look, I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. And then finally she says, yeah, okay. I had a little disdain for people. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, where, where that's from or what she's exactly referring to. Um, I, I don't know if I, uh, have a, have a strong sense. I took it, you know, to be something along the lines of, you know, Arendt, Arendt believes that you have to make judgments, right? You have to, and, and that judgment doesn't always mean that everyone's the same. You know, she saw herself as, as different at some point and she was reading Kant and, and, and Kierkegaard and, and, and whomever else. And, you know, I think she saw herself was like, oh, well, this is what people should be doing. Why aren't they doing this? So there was a bit of disdain um, that she had. Uh, you know, she, she talks about uh, in, 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 in her essay on, on some of her writing on judgment, she talks about that one of the problems today is that um, under the idea that we're all equal, people don't um judge other people and that you sometimes have to feel yourself better uh that doesn't mean you have more rights it doesn't mean you have anything like you know that other people are lower than you but it does mean that uh you should you should be willing to judge people as wasting their time or not um and i think she's okay with that I'm not entirely sure if that's what you had in mind, but uh, I thought that's what I remember thinking when I saw it. I, um, you know, it's, uh, it's who she is. Um, she's somewhat arrogant. Uh, and uh, um, I don't think it's worth our efforts to uh, try and, and whitewash that out. Um, it's, it's an important part of, of, of what she imagines. And, she, you know, and again, it's an arrogance that doesn't lead her thinking she's better than other people in, in anything except the fact that her opinion is this is what you should do. And if you don't do it, you know, what can I do with you? Um, uh, Richard Kaufman writes, I'm going to try and balance the chat and, and the, uh, and the, uh, and the, and the, and the hands. Richard Kaufman writes, uh, when she talks about German intellectuals making things up, was she talking about Heidegger in particular, do you think? Um, so the answer is that in particular, no. I think she had a lot of people in mind. Um, there are a number of, of her friends that she has in mind and that she writes about and that she felt 
uh, 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 made things up and uh, and and went along with 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 Hitler. But there's no doubt that Heidegger is is is, is in her mind at this point. Um, you know, she makes a very clear uh, distinction between those who um, simply joined the party and those who murdered or uh, informed on others. Uh, and obviously Heidegger would be on one side, not the other. Uh, he didn't murder or inform on anybody. Um, she, she also makes a distinction between those who um, commit, were committed to Nazism for a few months or at the worst, a few years. Uh, and again, Heidegger would fit into the few months or at the worst, a few years side of that. Um, another thing uh, she says is that when I went back to Germany, when she went back to Germany, I got into very heated arguments with my friends and I'm not polite. And I told them what I thought. And as long as they satisfied me, I was able to recreate a personal relationship with them. And that I think is uh, to some degree part of her conversation with Heidegger. Um, she went back to Germany for the first time, as she says here in, in 1949, she was the executive director of the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Commission. Um, she went to Germany sent by this commission with Gershom Sholem, who was sent by the partner organization in Israel to research and find as much cultural goods of the Jewish people in Europe that they could find. Stuff that had been stolen by the Nazis or hidden or whatever. And then they made a decision not to give it back to the places that it came from in, in Eastern Europe or Germany because there were no Jews there, but to divide it up um, I think it was 40% to Jewish organizations in America, 40% to Jewish organizations in Israel, and the last 20% to other Jewish organizations around the world. And at the very end of her trip, she finds herself um, down in Freiburg uh, near Heidegger. And uh, she actually calls up Mary McCarthy, apparently in Paris, and says, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Should I talk to him? Should I not talk to him? Nah, nah, nah. And Mary McCarthy said, look, you're still in love with him, obviously, go talk to the guy. So she sends him a note and they meet, they go for a walk in the black forest. And, um, you know, a lot was talked about. We have, um, we have Heidegger's letter to Arendt about that walk. We, he burned or destroyed her letter to him. But uh, um, in any case, uh, it was uh, clearly she makes some sort of personal uh, um, reconciliation with Heidegger. And, uh, and that's an important um, distinction here. So um, yeah, to Richard, um, I, think, I think Heidegger is, is definitely in, in, in the background. Um, John McCready, I see, welcome. Let me unmute you if that works. Great, John, how are you? Good, Roger. Um, I wanted to go back to right at the beginning of that interview where she talks about that tension between philosophy and politics. Uh, and she compares it to the existential tension that we have between being thinking beings and acting beings. And then just below that at the bottom of two, she's, uh, you know, Gal says, yeah, you, you, you don't want any part of this hatred of philosophy for politics. And she says, yeah, that's exactly right. I, I don't want to be involved in that kind of um, disdain being cast on it. Remember, she says all the time, I want to return the dignity to politics. Yeah. Um, but what what's uh, strange to me is when she says, I want to look at politics, so to speak, with the eyes unclouded by philosophy. And if I go back to the analogy of thinking and acting, then one way to interpret this on the surface is that she's saying, I want to look at politics without thinking, but that's clearly not what she <laughs> wants. Um, and so I'm wondering if, because this is said in the context of her discussing her reading of Kant, if what she finds in Kant is a kind of aesthetic thinking, 
uh, that is not the kind of discursive reasoning of, say, the, the linguistic turn in philosophy that she encountered at Berkeley, or the um, even the Heideggerian kind of thinking that takes you out of the world, um, but rather this aesthetic kind of thinking um, that Kant emphasizes about us in which we have a receptivity to the world and that we make ourselves vulnerable in some way to the world. Uh, and perhaps that's the kind of um, understanding of politics she wants to have. Um, yeah. Do you have a sense of what she means there? Yeah, I, I think, and, and so, first of all, it's a great question, um, John, and let, let me say, um, I, I don't, I'm not, obviously, I'm not going to go back and, and listen to it right now, but my memory of uh, the interview, and if anyone has listened to it right away and can tell me if they are German speakers, is she doesn't say, um, uh, this is between man as a thinking being and man as an acting being. Um, if I remember it correctly, she says, I philosophierende Wesen, a philosoph philosophizing being, um, and, uh, and an acting being, an authentic Wesen. Um, uh, and so I think that's just partly a translation issue. Uh, but, but the question still, uh, even, if, even if I'm wrong, and, and she did say uh, a thinking being, the, the question is a good one. What, is, what does she mean? Um, uh, by thinking and how does thinking cloud? Um, you know, so thinking is, you know, it, it's, 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 I think too easy to assume that thinking is always a positive for Hannah Arendt. Um, uh, obviously, she is a thinker and she thinks thinking is super important and, and writes a lot about it and, and yet um, she's also very much aware of the dangers and pitfalls of thinking. So early on in her work, you know, Rahel Van Hagen, um, you know, she, she, she talks about how um, Rahel was this Jewish woman, was unhappy, and she fell into the pitfall of thinking. And she thought through thinking she could recreate her life. And, and so there's a way in which thinking has a kind of reality, an antagonism to reality. You can create thought worlds, fantasy worlds, fictions, which is where she finds the essence of totalitarianism in coherent fictional logical thought worlds. Uh, and, um, and so thinking you know, she says there are no dangerous thoughts. Thinking itself is dangerous. Well, people always, I mean, a lot of people read that as a cliche and think, oh, she's talking about how thinking is good because it's dangerous. But thinking itself is dangerous. Why? Because it destroys the common world. It destroys what we share. Thinking can actually question the traditions, what we value, um, and it can lead to nihilism. And if it leads to nihilism, it can also lead to a kind of totalitarianism, um, where in a world in which the banisters are taken down, um, we can create new ones that are often violently imposed or, or made up. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, again, thinking is deeply important. It's, and, 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 and yet, when she says, I want to look at politics with eyes unclouded, I think it's by, um, uh, by, by thinking or, or philosophy, I think what she means is she wants to look at politics in its messiness, in its plurality, in all the different opinions and power struggles and desires and differences. I mean, I think this is her, her love of plurality and uniqueness and difference. Um, uh, and, and insofar as thinking seeks to put a stamp on something in one way or another to make it true, uh, or philosophy tries to do that. And if it tries to, um, measure the opinions by some yardstick of truth or measure as Plato talks about in the Republic, um, that's the, I think the, the way that 
philosophy clouds politics is it tells us there should be some truth. There should be some standards. And for her, that really doesn't fit. I think it's very hard for us to read some of this or think about this somewhat in the age of, of, of that we're in where people, you know, talk about how certain political leaders are violating standards and norms and not listening to experts and things of that sort. Yeah. I mean, one, one other thing I'll, uh, that I'm struck by at the end of the essay, which she's talking about Jaspers, she, she says what really um, impressed her about him was the connection he drew between reason and freedom and that for him what he says in reason and existence is that reason is possible existence and so uh and i think in that um uh, what is existence philosophy that that essay that she writes she points out that he kind of turned philosophy back towards politics and back towards the world in some way and so i'm wondering if she um sees a kind of philosophy that opens up in somebody like Jaspers that was closed off in somebody like Heidegger when she criticizes Heidegger for being one of those, um, uh, you know, people who want to get out of the cave and, and, uh, and uh, they end up uh, going after tyrants as a result of that kind of thinking. So I think you're right. It's, it's just was a tension I, I, I found interesting. No, you're right. That's you're, Jaspers for her is, um, precisely a kind of thinker who doesn't seek to uh, create standards or criteria for the truth. And that's what she values and loves in him. I mean, I'll also, the page before that, it's, you know, where she, she talks, she's asked, um, you know, that uh, he, uh, Gauss asks her, you say the ability to act is restricted to a few people. And what does that mean? And she immediately turns to this question about, experts. And she says, every statesman is surrounded and circled by an army of experts. So that now the question of action lies between the statesmen and experts. And I think what I want to say is that the, the perspective of the expert is somewhat the perspective of the philosopher. It's the perspective of someone who thinks they have criteria or standards for the truth. And, uh, and, um, in the next paragraph, she, she contrasts that with the American idea of spontaneous associations, the Tocquevillian idea of intermediate uh, organizations or institutions. And, um, and, and, and so politics is for her, and I guess this is, this is part of when I say she performs as an American speaking to a German, politics is not only about not being clouded by philosophy. Politics for her is about Americanness. I mean, this is her, she has this sense, whether it's right or not. I mean, um, she thinks that, you know, politics is about the, the everyday people joining institutions, joining organizations and protesting and doing civil disobedience. And, and for her, um, that is politics. And, uh, and she doesn't want that to be clouded by by, by philosophy. Um, Daphna writes about defending the indefensible uh, and intellectuals uh, and Tom Cotton. If people want to talk about that, we can. Um, I'm just looking to see um, if there's any other questions in the chat. Further evidence that not enough attention has been paid to the idea of objectivity versus impartiality. And this question of writing the truth, the section on page 19 was taken out of the abridged hour long video. Um, okay. Uh, um, I didn't, I, I'm sorry. I know we sent out different links to the video. There's, there's one that's an hour long and not one that's an hour and 12 minutes long. The hour long one is, is slightly abridged. I, I don't, I haven't paid enough attention to know what was taken out, but apparently they took out the, 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 the impartiality uh, discussion. I will say that the, the translation is abridged too. There are parts where, you know, two or three sentences at a time are taken out. I take it for clarity's sake. Um, uh, I don't know if people notice that. Uh, I see Bob Meyerson has a question. I'm gonna unmute you, Bob, if it works. Um, and uh, let you ask your question. Yes, okay, Bob. Are you Bob. Here? 
Are yeah. you hearing me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, um, you partially answered this, but um, her invidious comparison of philosophy to, and I don't have the text in front of me, but political thought or uh, how she characterizes it uh, seems a bit of a straw man that enables her to set up this uh, idea of, of politics as, as not being a matter for experts. And like you just said that, you know, philosophy sets up standards of truth. But I think that's unfair. And maybe you could respond to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she's, she's talking about a very particular view of philosophy, um, which comes out of Plato, right? So, um, and, and, and by the way, this is somewhat of a Heideggerian reading of Plato, um, and we can find other readings of Plato as well. Um, but the, the basic argument is that um, uh, with Plato, uh, before Plato, you had Socrates, who was engaged in dialogue and discourse, and, 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 and thinking was part of the public realm, and, and Socrates' whole claim was, I don't know anything, right? I, the Delphic Oracle told me, you know, uh, it's, I know nothing and that's what I take to be and all I do is try and show other people that they know nothing as well. With Plato, you get this idea of, um, of, 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 tr of certainty, of truth, of orthodoxy, ta orthos, uh, in, in, the, in, in, in book seven of, of the Republic. And, um, and the reading here is that uh, Plato began the tradition of philosophy that seeks uh, eternal truths, that seeks truths that are of the ideas of, um, and that are true not just in reality but forever, and that um, and that this idea of truth, uh, of philosophical truth, um, which you attain through contemplation or through geometry, you know, for Plato, you, you're not allowed to do philosophy until you know geometry. All of that is designed to take you away from the world and to put you into a world of ideas. And those ideas can be pure and true. And, and clearly not all philosophers um, believe that or, or act that way. Um, Arendt uh, makes the argument that the tradition of philosophy, at least the Western tradition of philosophy, which is the tradition she, she deals with, um, is so caught up uh, in this um, desperate need for, for orthodoxy, for truth, for the ideas, for idealism, um, that uh, it really, you can't engage in it uh, and be a philosopher and not get caught up in that. Um, I mean, again, I mean, you could, but she's saying that for her, um, it's a beautiful thing, philosophy. She reads it, she loves it, she, 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 she teaches it, she, 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 she studied it, she says she's most at home there, uh, but she doesn't think um, it's healthy for politics. Um, so I guess that's the, that's the crux of the argument, Bob. Is that maybe it doesn't satisfy you? I don't know. You're very, it's very no, nice I'm, outside, I see. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that, that satisfies me, but I don't see that as very different from what every philosopher who comes along says, you know, Wittgenstein thought he was maybe turning philosophy on its head or figuring out uh, where philosophy should go and Hegel perhaps thought the same in Spinoza and you know, you just go through the history of philosophy and anybody who has a point of view is probably uh, going to uh, contrast that with the philosophy to date. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, all she, what she says is, look, I mean, I just don't want to get caught up in this argument. I don't call myself a philosopher. I mean, it's not that she doesn't like philosophers and, or philosophy. She loves it. She, she spends her whole life reading philosophy. It's not what she wants to identify as. Um, 
And, uh, you know, some people would say she's somewhat disingenuous because clearly she's philosophical. I mean, that's what Gauss thinks. Um, and I don't think she would deny that she's philosophical. She just doesn't want philosophy to be what she's doing. She's not pursuing truth to go back to the objectivity question. And she thinks that most philosophy in some way is concerned with truth. Um, even Heidegger, you know, for whom uh, truth has to be redefined and, and rethought. But for her, Heidegger still is a philosopher. He, in his ideal sense, the philosopher stands in the clearing of being in an aligness, in an event of appropriation where I reach and I think being and being grabs me. And great, uh, but for her, that's not politics. And that view of that view, when it's brought into the political world, um, denies what she thinks is most important about politics, which is that it's plural, uh, and uh, and that there's no truth in it. Thank you. Yep. Um, let's see, uh, Christina Samarcus, I'm going to unmute you. It's a lot of hands, I see, so I'll see what I can do. Hi, um, this is actually my first time here, so... Uh, Welcome, thank you. <laughs> for having me, uh, for picking me. Um, I just had a question about one of the things you brought up in the beginning of the conversation about how uh, Gauss is asking her if she's a feminist, which is not really an interpretation that I saw both watching the interview and uh, just reading, reading the text myself. She said, you know, and, and she was born in 1906. So I am taking this with a grain of salt. She says, I, I had always thought there were certain occupations that were improper for women that do not become them, if I put it that way. And then she says she should uh, try not to get into such a situation if she wants to remain feminine. But the tone of the interview itself, she doesn't seem to be taking that very seriously. It doesn't seem like a prescriptive. You must appear feminine and therefore you must not do these occupations. It, it seems a little tongue in cheek and, and quite ironic when she does talk about tone later. She says, you know, I was being, I was being ironic and people don't seem to get that and that's why I'm being misunderstood. I don't think she would prescribe herself to say women shouldn't do these occupations because they are women or because it's unfeminine. I think she's commenting on the public perception of certain occupations being, fe and you know, he says, oh, well, this is a very masculine thing. She clearly doesn't take him seriously on that front. So I was just wondering if, if anyone else had kind of taken it that way. I didn't, I didn't see that as a commentary on her as a feminist versus non-feminist. Yeah, um, that, that's, I mean, you know, he asks her, or he says, let's turn to the questions of women's emancipation, which I took to be uh, uh, another a, a way for saying feminism, but maybe, maybe that was a, a mistake. Um, you know, Arendt is gonna be critical of all isms. Right? This is thing we've, we've talked a lot about, whether it's Nazism or environmentalism or feminism. She's not a fan of isms. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so she, she tries to deflect, I think you're right, that question. And she tries to bring it into uh, examples and concrete things. And so um, she says, let's just look at the answer very closely. Uh, has this been a problem for you, being a woman, he asks. And she says, yes, of course, right? It has been difficult, right? Um, there is always the problem as such. Um, or maybe that's a question of, has the problem of being a woman been a problem for you? And she, But then she says, I have actually been rather old-fashioned. I always thought that there are certain occupations that are improper for women, that not become, not become them, if I may put it that way. And then she gives, I think what's, you know, you said ironic, it's some tongue in cheek, but I think it's, I think it's her opinion. Um, it just doesn't look good when a woman gives orders. Uh, you know, uh, I think a lot of people will recoil at that today. Um, you know, I think it, this is to some degree who she was. Um, she doesn't in any way want to impose it on others, but she doesn't want to back away from it. It's, it's, it's her, it's who she is. She says she should not try to get into a situation she wants if she wants to remain feminine. Again, something many of us would recoil from. Um, 
Whether I am right about this or not, I do not know. I mean, I take that to be, I mean, tongue in cheek is interesting. I, I, I take it to be that she has opinions on this that she realizes not a lot of people are sharing right now. And she's saying, look, I might be wrong. This is my opinion. It's not something I focused a lot on. And then she says, I myself have always lived in accordance with more or less um, unconsciously, uh, or rather, let us say, more or less consciously. The problem itself played no role for me personally. To put it very simply, I have always done what I liked to do. And I guess what I, all I can say is I think that's her view. <laughs> I've done what I like to do. Uh, and, um, and I think she, she acts that way. Um, I don't know. Uh, did you find it offensive or did you find it interesting? I'm just wondering how you reacted to it. I didn't, I didn't find it offensive. I, the reason I think I found it tongue in cheek is because, you know, she's saying, oh, these things are improper. These things you shouldn't do if you want to remain feminine, but I did whatever I wanted. Yeah. So it's clearly not something it's, it may be something that she doesn't recommend doing, but it's clearly not enough stock for her that she herself would ever refrain from doing so. If you're growing up in 1906, you understand that there aren't a lot of female philosophers really in any country, but you know, the question of women's emancipation or women's lack of emancipation specifically at that time was not enough of a, of an obstacle for her to do this. So yes, there are some, you know, it doesn't look good. And I think a lot of times today people find a very, you know, aggressive and assertive woman. It comes off as bossy or like, what is this? a ball buster? Uh, it's not a compliment, but you should do it anyways. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I think she, she, I guess what you see is she's very honest. She holds certain old fashioned views about what women should do and how they should act. But that doesn't mean she's not going to do what she wants to do. Um, you know, and, and you can call that a feminist attitude. She wouldn't. She would just say, that's who I am. Um, uh, but uh, I think she understands the problem. I, I think there's a good argument to read Arendt as a feminist. And, the, and, and, it, and, it, and it comes up later when she says to him, you know, that was a very male question. When he asked, what are the effects of seek effects? I think she sees this sort of pursuit of truth or pursuit of meaning or of, of being mattering and, 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 and having import in the world um, as, as, as you know, she says a male. I think that's tongue in cheek, but it's also important for who she is. Her fundamental orientation to the world is pluralistic and that there is no one truth. There's, you know, Mankind was, was made to Adam and Eve, uh, a line she makes much of in the Bible. Um, and, uh, and, and she takes that plurality uh, deeply to heart. And, um, and, and so that's where I, I think you can read her as seeking to destabilize a unitary order, which some people would call a male or patriarch order, if, that, um, if that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Steven, uh, let's see, can I unmute you? Yes, Steven, you're unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? I do. Oh, thank you very much. This is my first time too, and thank All you right, for welcome. organizing this. people coming. I have uh, just two observations to make. Uh, early in the interview, Har Arendt tosses off, well, not really tosses off, but says that she's after understanding, Verstehung. Yeah. And there's a tradition of that term in German thought, if not in what would be called mainstream philosophy. There's the famous uh, Wilhelm Diltai, who made his whole career on the notion of understanding history as distinct from what you might call reducing history to a set of occurrences under general laws. Uh, so th that's something I, I wonder if Arendt had any conscious uh, awareness of Diltai or, or uh, whether she uh, just came to the same kind of conclusions on her own. And the second observation I'd make is that I didn't find it too surprising that she said what, what she did say about women philosophers, uh, but it, it is the case that in the 1950s and earlier, there certainly were women philosophers in the British tradition, but all that, all that may suggest is that there wasn't much 
rapport or rapprochement going on between British philosophy and uh, European philosophy. There's uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, uh, Mary Warnock, and others who were flourishing at the same time that, uh, that Arendt was. So just those two observations. Yeah, I mean, that's a very different style of philosophy than Arendt would do. So, um, you know, I mean, this, this may come back to her arrogance of some sort. I don't know um, what she would say. I mean, I thought it was very, I mean, the most surprising part of that interaction um, is when she says, it does not have to remain a masculine occupation. It is entirely possible that a woman will one day be a philosopher. I mean, there have clearly been um, women thinkers at this point in 1964, as you just point out. Um, and that raises a question of what Arendt means by a philosopher. Um, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll leave that for now. Uh, the question on understanding uh, is a good one. Um, you know, I think in many ways, uh, Kant is the, is the, is more so than Diltai, although she's certainly aware of Diltai and wrote a review of him, which we'll read later in this book. Uh, later, there's a review of Diltai uh, coming up in, in the reading. Um, but uh, Kant distinguishes understanding from reason, right, in, 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 in his work. And, uh, and reason, um, uh, for Arendt would be on the side of philosophy and, and truth. Um, and uh, whereas understanding, at least in her work, um, is uh, um, more along the lines of grappling with a real problem from, from concrete, uh, concrete, a concrete angle. Um, she'll say in, in, in the preface to both origins and again in the preface to the anti-Semitism book, that co comprehension, uh, which is a word she uses pretty much interchangeably with understanding, is the um, unmitigated facing up to and resisting of reality, whatever it may be. And um, so, uh, and in and in and in her essay on understanding and politics again, which is in this es in this collection, which, in my view, is probably the most important and best essay in this collection, um, which we'll get to uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, she'll she'll say that what understanding seeks is not truth or not um, an answer, but an in, you know a deep engagement and understanding of the different aspects of the of the problem. Um, and so uh, understanding is, is for her um, the process of engaging and working out from many perspectives, thinking from different perspectives and, and then coming to some uh, judgment at the end um, of, of comprehending is, is the unpremeditated facing up to what it is, looking at all the different perspectives, taking even the ones you hate, listening to them, trying to understand it then say, this is what is, this is what real is. And then you can either accept the reality, reconcile yourself to it, or you can resist it. Um, and that's, that's I think, um, the way she uses understanding, Stephen, if that's okay, if that makes some sense to you. It, it does, it clarifies it quite a bit, thank you. Okay, good, thank you and welcome. Um, Anita Howarth, I'm gonna unmute you. And let's see if it works. I unmuted and then muted again. All right, Anita, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, thank you. Yep. Um, I wanted to pick up on that point that you made about comprehension and understanding because in, in the origin, she sets up a very good case for what she was trying to do and that was to understand totalitarianism. And I think that her rejection of ration, the, the sort of obsessive, valorizing of rationality is that it gets in the way of understanding in certain in certain contexts um, and in particular I thought there's a passage where it, it becomes quite clear when she says she talks about the the um, the fire the Reichstag fire having a, a lasting impression but what was decisive 
was, was not the year 1933. What was decisive was the day we learned about Auschwitz in 1943. And she goes on and says, we didn't believe it at first because militarily it was unnecessary and uncalled for. Um, and she goes on to say, this ought not to have happened. And I don't mean just the number of method, uh, victims, I mean the method, the fabrication of corpses and all that. Something happened there to which we cannot reconcile ourselves. And I think what she's grappling with, philosophy is never going to be able to understand that. Rational thought can't understand something that seems so utterly irrational, that it's driven by something beyond it. And I think what she, her thinking is moving into modes of thinking that would allow her to somehow comprehend almost the incomprehensible while not reconciling herself to what cannot, because it, she goes on to say, you can, you, know, you can make amends for almost anything. You can't make amends for that. And I think this is what she's grappling with, is what kind of thinking would help her to comprehend or understand. It's page 13 and 14 that I'm looking at. Right. No, I, you know, I, I, that's a really wonderful question and, 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 and insights that you've offered, Anita. Um, you know, what, she, what understanding, I mean, I'm going to, I'll try one more time, but I mean, to, and I think now with what you said in the background, understand, you know, there's a famous um, saying that to, to understand everything is to pardon everything. And um, because if you can understand it, you can pardon it. And that's why it's so important that what she says is that to understand or to comprehend is to face up to reality and resist it if you need to. Um, understanding is the process of thinking through what has happened and asking yourself the question, A, what has happened? What is? What really happened? And B, can I live in a world? Can I love a world? Right? So, you know, we, we make a lot of it, the RN Center, this idea of Amor Mundi, the love of the world. Can I love a world in which this has happened? And, and I think the, the passages you brought up are, are really apt. You know, RN says many times things along the lines of, look, people die. She says what was bad about the Holocaust was not even that 6 million people died, right? I mean, you know, we're going through coronavirus now and people are counting up the deaths. Arendt has sort of a tragic view of the world. You know, the amount of deaths is not what she's worried about. What more so than the Reichstag fire, more so than the arrests, more so than the Nazis took over, more so than the people were killed. She says that people have enemies. This happens throughout the world. What for her needed to be understood, as you rightly put it, was the method, the fabrication of corpses in a bureaucratic gassing of people in camps. The fact that that could be done when it had no political or economic or military use, simply put, how could something like this happen? And and she 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 raised you know she says um, when she first heard about this she and her husband they didn't believe it right um, and then it was proven it was made clear that it happened and she said this what they what they what they kept saying is this should not have happened and we can't become finished with this men cannot fatigue werden with this we cannot be finish up with this it's 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 something that in a sense. You can understand it, but to understand it, which was her goal, as she said, I, I, she wrote the book to understand or comprehend, you can't reconcile with it. You can't be finished with it. Um, and that's why, as I argued when we read Eichmann in Jerusalem a few months ago, the reason she thinks Eichmann should be killed at the end of that book is not that he broke rules or broke the law or that he was anti-Semitic or any of this. It's that for her, he participated in the bureaucratic extermination, fabrication of corpses that cannot be reconciled with, that we can never finish with. And that in order to 
love the world, we have to, in a sense, exclude. We have to, we have to kill someone who is so associated with that, with that activity. Um, and I take that to me, I take that to be um, deeply embedded with what she means um, by understanding. How do you understand something like this? And then once you do, how do you respond to it? Um, and, and that is the project uh, that, sh that occupies her really from, from 1943 until 19, I would say 55. She, she publishes The Origins in 1950, um, but she continues to rework it and republish essays actually precisely on that topic through the 1950s including understanding and in politics, which I said we'll read later in, the, in, the, in, this, in this book, um, which is, I think, written in 1952. Um, and uh, these are essays in which she's actually asking that question. What does it mean to understand the Holocaust? What does it mean to understand what happens? And, and that's what she's struggling with. Um, so yeah, we'll keep coming back to this as we, as we, as we go through this book. Um, is that all right, Anita? Do you want to yeah, add? No, thank you. That was very helpful. Thank Would you, you like to add anything or, or not? Uh, so, okay. yeah, could I just ask one other thing? When she talks about fabrication of corpses, what does she mean by fabrication? So she talks about the fabrication of, of, of um, thoughts and ideas elsewhere. What does she mean by fabrication? So I think there's two resonances. So one is that in, in German, a, a, fact, a, a fabrique is a factory. Um, and so uh, she's, there's probably a sense of, of the using of the camps as factories of corpses. Okay. Um, but uh, she also, um, she's very, she uses the word of fabrication, uh, of making, of creation as a human creation. Um, that the world is a fabricated world. And, and so it's a, it's a world in which humans make the decision to um, uh, build a world of corpses in these camps. Um, and it's that kind of, manuf I think in both these senses, it's a manufacturing process, but one that humans engage in, um, but one that had no use, no military use, no, no economic use, uh, was simply to eliminate um, uh, certain races from the face of the earth, um, which for her was um, something that was unthinkable beforehand. And now that it's thinkable, and now that we understand it, it's something that cannot be pardoned or reconciled with. It has to be, you have to resist it, and you have to, to the extent you can, almost um, seek to uh, expel it, not by whitewashing it or, or hiding it, but by things like saying you have to die to those who are involved. Um, not as punishment because their crimes were too much to be punished, but as simply a statement that the world in which you could do what you did is not a world I can accept. Thank you. Um, Francisca, I'm gonna unmute you if I can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I want to go back to the beginning when you said um, that um, this interview was performed and that uh, Hannah Arendt performed as an American, as a feminist, and also as a Jewish woman. And um, uh, I'm curious how you define this. How does one perform Jewish? And that is not so much a question of maybe the content, but more of the, uh, maybe the tone or the demeanor. Um, I grew up in Germany, so to me it feels German, but yeah. I'm, I'm interested in what is Jewish about it. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, well, I mean, I think the first thing is that um, whenever Arendt, um, spoke publicly in Europe, she always 
very quickly identifies herself as a Jew. Um, and, and of course she did quickly in this, in this interview as well. Um, so when she uh, accepted the stunning prize and I think, uh, I forget the year, um, she says, I stand before you as a, as a Jew and as a, and as a, a feminine, feminine genus, uh, you know, a, a woman. Um, uh, I think she took that, uh, political act of, a, of not appearing as a universal citizen or as a, uh, you know, a, a, a das der Mann in the sort of sense of a, a dementia. Yeah? Uh, she, she, she wanted to emphasize that she was a Jew and that she was a woman. And I think that was particularly the case when she was in Europe and especially in Germany. Um, why? Um, you know, I think, uh, I think to, um, to remind people of the particularity of her viewpoints and of the need for the particularity of viewpoints. I mean, you know, shortly before this exchange that she has with Gunter Gauss, um, Mercure, the, the German publication Mercure, which I'm sure you know of, um, uh, asked, no, okay, it was a, it was a big, it was, a, it was like one of the main cultural magazines in Germany. I think it's still in print, but I, maybe it's not anymore. Um, asked her to review um, Hans Magnus Enzenberger's uh, book, Politik und Verbrecher, um, Politics and Crime. And she refused. And she wrote Enzenberger and they had a very nasty exchange of letters. I mean, not nasty, I shouldn't say that, very angry uh, exchange of letters um, in which she says that she disliked his book so much um, and what she disliked about it was his equating of the Holocaust with other similar mass murders and trying to sort of think the Holocaust in sort of a, a general way. Um, and she sort of said you can't, and she says to him, a German can't understand the Holocaust without reference to its particularity. Um, you know, and I think uh, a lot of people would say, but so much of her work is thinking things through in the abstract and, 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 and trying to set these kind of analyses. Um, and there's some truth to that. Uh, but um, for whatever reasons, um, she, first of all, I think she, she doesn't believe that there's sort of like some abstract that we're all just humans, right? She thinks she's a Jew and a woman and it matters. Um, but I think she also felt that it was important for Germans to understand her as a Jew. Uh, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure she felt that. Um, not because they wanted him, that they, she wanted them to feel guilty because she didn't think they should be guilty not because they wanted her that she wanted them to, to you know to apologize or anything like that but she wanted them to understand that her thinking about this is the thinking of a jewish woman who was born in germany who loves german language who never felt german at least culturally german uh and found a new home in america um for her, those were all important truths about herself and that her thinking couldn't really be separated from them, I think. And that's how I interpret that. Um, none of it's an accusation. I mean, she, if anything, it's the opposite. She, you know, she, she wants to say over and over again that there's no such thing as collective guilt. Um, and she doesn't think that all Germans uh, are guilty. Um, but she does think that all people and all Germans have a responsibility to confront and seek to understand what happened. And that to do that, um, one thing they have to understand is that she's a Jew. And we, we talked about this, for those of you who are reading Men in Dark Times, when we read the Lessing essay, again, you know, at a, between a German and a Jew, to simply say we're friends she thinks 
at least in the 1930s and 40s, is, 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 a, is a complete um, evasion of the truth of what's going on. You have to say, we're a German and a Jew, and we'll seek to be what we can. And, uh, and, um, and for her, I think the Holocaust was still deep enough that she couldn't just come to Germany and portray herself as a person. Um, you know, uh, I mean, this is minor, but when I was first living in Germany, I, I, I found that every once in a while I would get into conversations with something and people would say something about Jews or the Holocaust that weren't mean or awful, but I realized that they didn't know I was Jewish. And, uh, and you know, I mean, I have a Jewish name, I, but in Germany, it's just people don't think today you're a Jew. So at least this was 30 years ago, so maybe it's different now. But um, I didn't want to just, therefore, when I started meeting people say I'm Jewish. So I actually stopped eating pork. It was when I stopped eating pork. And, um, and the reason was simply because then if I became friends with someone, they would immediately realize I was Jewish because why would I not eat pork? And um, it, was, uh, it was a way of letting them know and it became absolutely very important for me living in Germany for people, not because I wanted anything special. I just wanted them to know. And uh, I am not, not saying I and Arendt have the same reasons, but it's, it was an important part of, of, of living there for me. Um, and so uh, I just put that out there. Does that make, I mean, you want to add anything, Francesca? Um. Thank you for your sharing. Um, I, I, I mean, it, you, you answered it partially, but I always also was thinking that uh, later on when she talks about her mother, she talks about like a, uh, an old fashioned warmth and open mindedness that, um, that um, exists between um, oppressed people or pariahs. I don't know if I understood this correctly. Um, so I was kind of like, um, trying to figure out if something in her way of talking uh, and addressing certain problems uh, strikes you as uh, Jewish more than as German. Well, I mean, again, uh, you know, these are stereotypes of some sort, uh, but you know, her, her use of her hands is typically thought of as a very Jewish, you know, you taught Jews talk with our hands and things like that. Um, I, I don't know if that's something uh, you, you agree with or not. Uh, it's a stereotype. Um, uh, I, I think a lot of her irony and, and, and stuff is thought by some people to be a Jewish kind of trait. Um, uh, so, you know, by the, the question of the pariah people, what she's talking about there is um, that if you are an oppressed people who are not allowed to engage in the politics of the country you're in. So Jews for much of their history until the founding of the state of Israel and since the old Israel um, or Palestine um, uh, largely lived as uh, in, in, in ghettos, in, in, in cities in which they didn't have full rights. And what she says is uh, there's a great freedom that comes with that because you don't have to engage in the public and you can, you know, spend time with your family and prioritize warmth and caring and love. And there's a wonderful freedom to that, but there's also something lost, which is you don't have a public life. And she says with the, with the uh, founding of Israel, in many ways, Jews will, from now on, lose that pariahness, that public, that that feeling of of, of freedom, um, of being hidden, um, and uh, now they will have a responsibility to act politically, and that there's a great loss of freedom that comes with that. It's a price, but it's a price worth paying for her because she thinks that um, public life is 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 so important. Um, Amari. Oh, hi, Roger. Thank you. Um, well, after that question of Francisca, that was a very good question. I'm going to stay awake all night <laughs> thinking how, what, how can we perform any identity? Well, I have a, uh, two, three 
concrete question. The first is one that uh, maybe I'm reading too much into it. But when you said, while you were introducing the test, what we do, what we are, two questions that is very present in Hannah Aaron's thought, especially in this interview, uh, can we make some sort of connection between the ideas of uh, ready to hand or present at hand of Heidegger? That means that the things that you interact with the objects with a uh, with the finality that you set to the object or maybe your relationship to the world. And that's something that came right into my mind when you were talking about it. Second, how can we connect uh, the fact that in many in dark times we were talking about embarrassing ourselves when we are talking to another. And I'm thinking, what about the persons that feel more comfortable talking in their mother tongue and not in some other language. Maybe if you decide to talk in some other tongue to create the communication channel is a way to embarrass yourself, but at the same time to commit to another person and, you know, to keep digging into the communication project. And third, and this is the last one, um, her criticism to intellectuals, and this is coming after a really good conversation with Tara and Renee in the chat. Maybe we can say that, or we cannot say it. Uh, the rationalization, something that intellectuals engage, is just to put forward reasons to explain the world without actually explaining or understanding why these reasons are such explaining the world. And maybe that's what something that Harens was really worried about to understand why we're going to give these reasons instead of just giving reasons just to rationalize or give a motive or some kind of sense to the behavior or the world outside of us. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks, Amari. Because um, we're short on time, I'm going to largely pivot to the third question, which just, just because it's where a lot of my thinking is right now. Um, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things Arendt will say over and again in, in so many places is that intellectuals, and, and by the way, I mean, again, just like with philosophers, what is an intellectual? By an intellectual, she means something she has on the one hand, an intellectual is someone who um, thinks and uh, gets lost in thinking and often disconnects from the world in doing so. But she also uh, is, um, sees that many intellectuals want to matter, want to be important, want to work for, whether it's corporations or governments, and um, they will basically sell their services to whoever's in power. Um, and she thinks that they have a terrible record of, uh, of, of not doing so. Um, not only in Germany, but during the Vietnam War, where she writes a lot about this, and during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, she, she just doesn't think intellectuals... Uh, um, uh, have a good record of of uh, of not serving evil, um, and and one has to ask why that is. Uh, um, and I take you know her her answer to be something along the lines of they're just their 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 defect, their professional defect as intellectuals is that they, A, they see things as problems and they wanna solve problems and they don't really, and they get caught up in the problem that, and solving it, they don't actually think about it and what the consequences of it are. And, and B, if there are bad consequences of it, they rationalize it and they're good at rationalizing it. They're like, well, okay, it's bad, but you know what? We can, we can make it work. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's her, uh, that's her worry. Um, uh, you know, we can obviously. This is not true for all intellectuals, and 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 it's not. And, and this is not an argument against um, 
thinking, but it's an argument about the danger that intellectuals pose. Um, you know, again, we, we use the word intellectual in different ways. Um, you know, an intellectual can be a poet, but for her, an intellectual is someone who is part of a, a milieu and in our society, increasingly part of a bureaucracy, whether it's the deep state or, or, the, or, or the environmental protection agency or a university bureaucracy um, uh, or, or a corporate bureaucracy or a military bureaucracy. And what she says is um, intellectuals become bureaucrats. Uh, and, in, and in becoming bureaucrats, they seek to serve organizational purposes. They become organization people. Um, and, um, and that's dangerous. Now, obviously a thinker would be anti-bureaucratic. And, and so I think it is, there's a distinction to be made between a thinker and, a, and an intellectual for her, but uh, it's at least worrying. We're sort of out of time, but I'm gonna take one more question because one of my former students is here asking a question. So Lauren, um, go for it. If people need to go, I understand. Uh, I will come back next week. We're going to read um, uh, some of the, uh, some of these early, early essays by Arendt uh, for next week. Um, Augustine and Protestantism and philosophy and sociology, I think, are the two. Uh, maybe Kierkegaard, too. It's on the website if you need to find it, and we'll send out an email soon. But thank you. But uh, Lauren, um, why don't you hi. say hi and ask your question? How's it going? Good, how are um, you? Pretty good, yeah, surviving. Good. Um, I, uh, I was interested about this quote on page 19. Uh, she starts talking about her options regarding the Eichmann book, and she says, you know, there's no real way to write it any differently. Either I could have written it or I could have not written it. And it made me think of what, something we were saying about two books ago where she kind of discounts the possibility of state-sponsored propaganda and I'm really wondering if a rent, if any kind of intentional deception is possible for her. It almost seems like she posits by saying she couldn't have written it any differently, that not only is it, you know, not a moral good to be deceptive, but maybe not even physically possible to say or write something that isn't what one is thinking. Yeah, I mean, I, I think she certainly believes that people do that. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, the, she give in on that same page 19, she says, she talks about these things called matters of truth of fact. Um, and, and she says the historical sciences and the universities are the guardians of truth of fact, to which Gauss replies, they've not always been the best ones. And she says, no, they are colla they collapse. Um, they are controlled by the state. And then she brings up, the Bolsheviks and Trotsky as well. So, I mean, she's well aware that people all the time uh, write and say things that go against uh, what, they, what they believe and know to be true. Um, she's simply talking about herself. Uh, she's saying that there's nothing could make her um, write a book that she didn't believe in. And if she felt that there were things that she couldn't say, she just wouldn't have written the book. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, that's the point here is that, you know, uh, you know, there are, she's like, she says, this is the really, the only really good question that has come out of writing the book for her is should she have not written the book? You know, I mean, she's like, I, if I write the book, I have to write it the way I write it. Cause I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna change what I think. This was my opinion. And I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to like censor myself. But she says, should I remain silent? Now, someone could say, wasn't well, that censoring yourself? Um, and, I, and I think the answer then is no, because if you choose to remain silent, um, you're choosing to say, you know, look, I have an opinion. Um, but, but this opinion is, is, is one that, maybe shouldn't, it's not time to put out there right now. And she says, Look, you know, with the Eichmann book, it was 20 years after the fact. And, and Gal says, well, maybe that wasn't long enough. And she's like, well, okay. She, he says, perhaps 20 years is still too little. And she says, 
Many people say that. Others say that after 20 years, one can no longer figure out the truth. In any case, there is an interest in whitewashing. That, however, is not a legitimate interest. And so it's, you know, like, I'm not going to whitewash it. That's, that's not going to happen. So do I be silent? And she said, look, I, I thought that, um, I think that what I had to say was important, not because it was true, but because it was impartial, because it raised important issues and it brought perspective to this, to this, to what happened during the Holocaust. And, uh, and, um, and she thinks that's important. Not so important that there aren't some times when you might not do it. You know, I mean, if you have a, you know, there's a lot of good points to make about race or uh, police today that might, you know, be controversial. Well, not saying them is not censoring. It's making a judgment that at times, at certain times, are not the right times to say everything that you believe. And I think she's saying that's actually a legitimate and important question to ask. Doesn't mean you're wrong if you say it per se, but it does mean that, you know, you may make a mistake of judgment and, um, and not, it's not at all times that we have to speak what we believe. I think that's an important point that she's making. Um, well, listen all, thank you very much. Uh, I'm thrilled to have so many of you joining us for, new book. This is a, a spectacular book. The first few essays are, are sort of from her youth after this one. And um, they'll be interesting to read, I think, more as a, as a, as a you know, an interesting intellectual history of, of where she's coming from. But they're all worth, they all have things in them worth our paying attention to. So I'm excited to talk about them with you. And then as we get into the book, you're going to see some of the best essays she, she wrote. So um, uh, I look forward to it. So uh, enjoy reading Hannah Arendt and um, I look forward to seeing you all next week.